So welcome to the Fuse Life Podcast. This is episode 114. We're staying on the theme of wealth and uh, riches, inheritance. What do they mean? What do they mean for us today? How do we move in it and operate in it with a pure heart? And uh, my guest today is a great example of that. I have been a good friend now of Robbie's for probably about two two years now, and it was just supernatural how we, how it started, and it's supernatural how it's continuing. Uh, Robbie, thank you so much for hanging out with us this morning. Joseph, thanks for having me, bro. Good to be with you, bro. Um, you know, I love I love what you're doing. I love the spaces you're involved in. I love the heart you carry. Just for those that don't know, can you just let them know what you're involved in and uh, what you do? Sure, Joseph. No worries. Yeah. Hey, guys. Thanks for joining us today. Um, One of the things I'm going to be talking about today is actually defining an outcome that you care about that wealth will actually enable you to to function with. So for me, I didn't start off with a lot of money. Um, In fact, I was I was pretty broke by the time I was 18, 19. You know, I didn't come from a lot of wealth. Uh, And my aim, my goal, Joseph, was really to get to a point um, where I had time freedom. That, that was the outcome I cared about, was to get to a point where the decisions that I make, the way I conduct my life, wasn't limited or restricted by wealth. So any anything that I do, wealth wouldn't come into the equation of my decision. So anyway, by the age of around 27, I, I reached that goal, got to a point where basically I didn't need to work for money. Money was working for me and I had time freedom. And so that enabled me to then focus on all the things I wanted to do. So what I'm working on now is basically just building multiple businesses. Probably the one I'm focusing on a lot at the moment is um, our property development business um, it's called Nectar Development Group based here in New Zealand. So we've got about at this stage about 14 projects on our books that we're working through. Um, we've also got a property investment company that I've been building up for the last 10 years. So, um, you know, have have that going as well. And then another really exciting project that I'm working on is um, actually building what, what I would define as a kingdom treasury. It's a foundation. It's based in New York. There's not Love a it. whole lot that I'm going to say about it right now because it's still sort of in, in the secret place, but it's going to be coming out soon. And that's that that project asks the question, how can we collectively as believers leverage our collective wealth to bring transformation? So, so when you look at the, the example of Moses, he leveraged the wealth of his nation to birth a divine blueprint. So mm-hmm. there was, there was a, a point where wealth came to a central point to where there was strategy, there was divine blueprints, there was skill sets that all overlap came together. So and then um, also the other project we're working on now is um, a, a 10-week training program here in New Zealand with my mentor and very good friend of mine, Ian Clayton. That's called Thunder Academy. So you can go to thunderacademy.org if you want to check that out. So that starts off in October. Um, outside of that, doing a lot of coaching, discipleship, mentoring, and have an incredible family, two young kids and a wife. And so, yeah, I'm a, I'm a busy man, but look, happy to be <laughs> Morning, Jason. Boom. Awesome. Well, there you go, guys. We're speaking to someone who knows what he's talking about. And that's what I think is very important. Like his journey qualifies him, you know. So I want to touch on a few things here, bro. Like um, activate, strategize your wealth part. I think these are three very important aspects. So can we start with activate? Like what are your thoughts around activation? Why is it important? And how can someone start that journey? Yeah, like I guess I guess I'll um, I'll start off with a story. So when you look at the prodigal son story, which we all know if you've read your Bible, you know it. But the, the interesting thing is the older son, right? He gets frustrated that the father, you know, um, what the father did for the younger son, and the father's response to me is is just so incredible. He says to him, the father says to the son, everything that's mine has always been yours. So in other words, why? Why didn't you just take what already had your name on it? And so I think when you look at the word activate, especially in the context of believers, oftentimes we're waiting on our father to give us something that he's already given us, right? And so this was a son who wasn't activated. He was dormant. He was latent. He was waiting, right? And 
had the number of times I hear people say, I'm just waiting on God for provision. I'm waiting on God for direction. I'm waiting on God for this. And so here was a, a son that was waiting for something that was, was already his. So when we talk about activation, oftentimes the activation is an activation in our own perspective, in our own mindset, in our own ability to take initiative to grab hold of something that's already got our names on it. And so on a very practical level, one of the ways in which I did this, I knew, I knew that I knew Joseph, that I was called to be wealthy. I know I knew that, right? And I had nothing to show for that. I had no physical evidence around me. I it didn't, it wasn't reflected in my bank balance. It wasn't reflected in my, my balance sheet. It wasn't reflected in my assets, but I knew that I knew in my spirit that I was called to be wealthy. So one of the things that I learned about is, is the importance of creating a visual anchor for, for that which you are believing for, right? And so one of the things I did is I printed out my bank account and had my name on the top and my bank account number. And the, the actual amount was like, I don't know, $20. Was, I can't even remember, $30. But I went into Photoshop and I changed that amount to $2 million. Hmm. And I put it up on my wall. And when I looked at that, it was frightening. It was uncomfortable. It was, it triggered my own, um, yeah, sense of uncertainty. But the more I saw it every day, the more I allowed that, that visual image to ingrain itself into my subconscious. And so what happened was the types of opportunities I went after, the types of contacts I met, the types of books I read, the types of yeah, my attitude, everything began to shift to align with that which I was believing for, mm. right? And so, again, what, what I want to mention is, you know, who cares about money in the bank? Like that, in many ways, it's irrelevant. What I cared about was what was the outcome? What was the outcome that that wealth was going to enable me to walk in? And that outcome was time freedom, the ability to choose how I use my time. All right, so one key of activation is is getting a visual anchor, right? And I guess that's my challenge to all of you today. It doesn't have to be a bank statement. It could be a picture of some sort. It could be a, a screenshot of your crypto account. It could be some, something that links you to wealth, a visual trigger that says, I am wealthy. I come into agreement with the wealth that I've, I've been destined to live with. So, yeah, there's something on activation. So good. And so when you say your wealth path, I mean, we've talked about this quite a bit and you're talking about how every person has their own wealth path. And we've both seen people try and pick someone else's wealth path and try and fit that and it's not worked, you know, can you touch on that a little bit, the individual wealth path? Yeah. So, you know, you see things all the, all the time about, you know, you should have all these various strings of income and you should have multiple approaches and, and you know that that is that is true to a degree, and I'll get to why it's. I believe it's partially true. It's just de it depends on timing, right? What I've seen oftentimes is people try and say, "I want to do crypto. I want to buy shares. I want to get into property, and I want to get into all of these things." And they try and bite off more than they can chew. And what ends up happening is they get overwhelmed, they choke, and they do nothing. So the approach that I took is I had one wealth path for 10 years. 10 years, Joseph, I didn't focus on anything else other than property, right? And so I believe that in the beginning of our wealth journey, don't try and create several streams of income. Just create one, right? Just one in the beginning. And then when the time comes, short, sure, diversify. But, but find find your strength so you know we've talked about the concept of ikigai which is what you're interested in what you're good at what you can be paid for and what the world needs right mm -hmm. let me say and what what you're good at what you can be paid for um what the world needs um yeah sorry what, what was the other one what did i miss anyway there's four things there what is inside you and how can we match what's inside of us to an opportunity Right. And so I see all the time people who are super creative and they try and get into share trading, which is a highly analytical, very detailed, very disciplined, very methodical, very mechanical type of process. You know, 
people who are really good at that are people often with a military background, right? And so I've tried, Joseph, probably on four or five occasions to get into share trading. And guess what? Every single time I lose my money, right? And so I've learned the hard way that, that there's a path that's assigned for me that's easy. It comes naturally. I enjoy it. I understand it. And so if you're in a place where you're trying to learn something and you're just going, oh, this is, I'm it's like pushing a bus up the hill. It's just not working for me. You know, take that as a learning and move on and go towards something that you find interesting, something that you're curious about, something, let me even say this, Joseph, something that has been unlocked in your family line, right? Mm. So, so, so for me, my father was involved in property investing. And so it came quite naturally to me. It was in my, it was in my genes, mm. right? So, um, there's something called the wealth dynamics test. It's by a guy called Roger Hamilton and that highlights eight entrepreneurial paths, pathways, mm. right? Um, so mm. I did that test 10 years ago and it was invaluable for me to, to understand what is my wiring? What is my path? Because what you avoid is just as important as what you focus on. Mm. And what I would say to that too, Joseph, is if you can identify someone who is wired similarly to you that has succeeded and you can sort of trace their steps as to how did they get to that position, Right. We live in a world where we get taught in our education system, don't cheat, don't look at your don't look at the answers of the person next to you. Well, guess what? In real life, it's the opposite. Look at the answers of the person next to you. Look at mm. what led to their success. Look at the process of what, what strategies did they implement? How did they go about it? And so for me, I really understand that there are my strengths and my weaknesses. I'm not that analytical. I'm not very detailed. Um, I'm not very thorough. I, um, and so because of that, I avoid certain wealth strategies that are not suited to my strengths. Mm. I am very creative. I'm really good with people. You know, like if you're, if you enjoy dealing with people, don't go and do something that you're going to be sitting behind spreadsheets all day. Totally. Right. So, so that's kind of, you know, some of my thoughts around that subject. Yeah. And I just want to just piggyback off that a little bit. I've seen that in my last 13 years doing business and the types of business that have been in the flow and the types that haven't, you know, so the trading stocks, shares, or even crypto to an extent, like there is, you know, like I, I know my sweet spot and I like, like you with people uh, going back and forth. And there is a certain type of person that I can have a conversation with that some people just get drained from, you know, but then if you put me into any administration role, like I'm done, like in half an hour, I'm drained, I'm finished. So I totally get what you're saying. And that's a big one, guys, because when money and wealth becomes a carrot that's dangled, and that's your focus, you will do anything to get it, including throw away your natural path to it, to find that, you know, and this is why I think it's important we understand this is from the I am. Like you are wealthy. You don't do wealth. You're not trying to find wealth. It comes from within you as you journey it out, you know. So that's so good. Last thing I just want to touch on, bro, is strategies. You know, you talk about uh, financial strategies in this realm and then spiritual tools or spiritual strategies and merging them together. Can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, so um... – one of, one of the concepts that I learned early on that has just always stuck with me and really resonated with me, Joseph, is, is this. When we, when we look at nature, right, like we can learn about, um, we can learn about the spirit world by looking at the physical world because the physical world was birthed out of the spiritual world, right? Mm. And we can understand aspects of the nature of God and the functionality of how, how his kingdom works through looking at nature. Hmm. Um, scripture talks references this metaphor of trees many times you know many times throughout scripture you'll see you know oaks of righteousness and you'll be planted like a tree you know by by by, by the river and all these all these various parts of scriptures that refer it, it compares us to trees right and um i learned about 
the way that trees function. Like the father said to me, go and look at how trees work. And so one of the things that I learned about trees is that when a tree grows a leaf, there's an energetic projection that comes from the branch, right? Where it projects the pattern of the leaf. Mm. Like this is not even a spiritual fact. It's just, it's scientific. Like you can Google it. The branch projects out energetically a pattern of the leaf so that when the material forms, right? When the leaf grows, the pattern of the leaf is is informed by the pre-existing energetic projection. Wow. Right? So think about that for a second. Um, whatever pattern the tree projects is what materializes physically. Okay? So in our hearts, in our lives, the circumstances we live in are informed by the energetic pattern that we project. It's not a complicated process. I know some of these words might might seem a little bit. I'm trying to boil it down to its simplest form. We have something like 80,000 subconscious thoughts a day. Thoughts have an energetic component to them, and it's projecting out into the world um, a certain frequency. Thoughts have a frequency. So thoughts lead to feelings. Feelings lead to beliefs, mindsets, habits, how we conduct ourselves how we show up, the types of connections we make, the types of opportunities we pursue, the types of circumstances that present themselves to us, the position we find ourselves in is linked to the thoughts we have and the energetic projection that we cast out into the world, Mm. right? So when I say things like give yourself a visual anchor for the future that you're believing for, um, what that does is it focuses that energetic projection, right? Um, and so in a, in, a, in a very real spiritual way, we can perceive and receive from the kingdom dimension a flow, right? And we become channels of that flow, which then influences how the material world responds to us, right? And I talked last time about when, when the Lord said to Cain that, Um, The earth will no longer yield its strength to you. In other words, the material world is intelligent. It recognizes who you are, what you've done. It recognizes your conduct. It picks up on your projection and it will respond to you accordingly. Right? If you can understand this, if we can understand this concept, we can understand that how responsible we are for the outcomes that are generated within our lives. And so linking the spiritual world to to the physical world, I would say this, we are spirit. And my mentor Ian always teaches about this. We are spirit. You are a spirit being created in the image of the Father of God who is spirit. He is spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So we are called to expand what already exists in that spirit dimension into the physical dimension. Right. So that is then worked out in very, very practical ways. And we can learn about this from people like Moses who who went up and the father said to him, see to it that you build according to the pattern that I showed you in the mountain. Build according to what? A pattern. What's a pattern? Right. Where did he show it to him? In the mountain. What's the mountain? A governmental arena in the spirit dimension where Moses was responsible for birthing a pattern that was designated in his time that started in a heavenly dimension, but materialized in a physical dimension. Nehemiah was an entrepreneur who brought together resources around a dream. So I just want to finish with this thought, if I may, Joseph, um, the, is there any other questions on that? And if I could just finish with a thought, that'd be great. Uh, that's great. I was going to ask you one last question, not on that though, but up yeah. to you if you want to yeah, go for it. You mentioned that you were, you know, you're broke or you didn't have much money in your bank account, right? And you started to have a visual anchor. You started to change your thinking. You started to change different things in your life. Can you touch on one important thing that you had to change to come here? Otherwise, you couldn't get to where you're at now. Um. Okay. It was an early principle as well that I learned. It's the the Jewish concept of teruma, which is um, 
which is one fortieth of a day's wage. And so it's called your first fruits, right? And so what I started doing is that when, and I, I saw it like this, Joseph, that the father was revealing himself to me through his body. Because if we're the body of Christ, then the father reveals himself to us oftentimes through people. And so mentors would show up. You know, um, people would show up who would share keys and strategies or people would show up and give me a book and or invite me to a conference or share ideas where where I had mentors, when I had people investing into me, whether it was time, whether it was knowledge, whether it was ideas, I would honor them financially. I would give. And so I think one thing that I did really well was even when I had very little, I would give to my mentors. I would give. And I still, to this day, I do that. And I would attribute that as one of, you know, you can't, you can't really succeed without that. And oftentimes when, when people say to me, you know, I want to be wealthy, I say, who's your mentor and are you paying them? You know? So, and I see that I so honor what you carry and the people that you're mentoring and, 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 and yeah, just so faithfully walking with, I love that. But, you know, we think sometimes we can learn a thing or two just from a podcast or YouTube or a book, all that stuff's great. And I definitely learned from that. But when there were people who were willing to invest their time, their effort, their energy, their ideas into me, I honored them financially. If you do that, everything will change. If you don't do that, good luck to you. <laughs> and I I can second that just with my life too and um, giving even when you don't like I know we, t we can turn it into a religious practice which some people do but it's really a matter of the heart and a matter of maturity because you become like your father in heaven you know and um, so I know for me same thing to rumor and that kind of shifted so much in uh, in finances for me you know so guys like if you're like oh well I don't have that much money you give in percentages you save up percentages and then you give, you know, so when I started, even though I didn't have much, I would just take a percentage like the Taruma is, a, you know, a 2.5 percent kind of thing. And I would let it accumulate and then give that, you know. So no matter where you are in your finance level, you have a percentage to give. It's not necessarily the absolute. And, and it's not even actually about the amount. It is the heart that it's coming from that I believe opens up pathways that you cannot open any other way. So I love that, man. And uh, you said you had one last thought as we wrap this up. Go for it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, bro. So the, the other thing that I want to leave with you guys is this, that sometimes, you know, to believe what means to hold on to, to grab onto something, right? So so what we're talking about is to, to grab onto something here, but we're also talking about letting go because letting go is equally important to holding on. So I want to finish with this story. So there's a guy in scripture that we see he's blind and, you know, he, he walks up to Christ. It says he lets go of his cloak and then the Lord heals him. He says to him, what do you want? You know, and basically that's what he says to him. What do you want? Which I think in and of itself is a very important statement. What do you want? Um, Cause it recognizes the will, his own sovereign will and brings that into the equation. Right. But what I never understood, Joseph, is why does this guy let go of his cloak? Like, that's kind of random. Like, why would the scripture say that? And so when someone explained this to me, it put it all into perspective. Back then in Israel, um, you couldn't just beg. On the streets, you couldn't just beg. Um, you needed a license to beg. And that license was issued to people who had legitimate reasons to, to beg. You know, people who were blind, people who couldn't work, people who were restricted in some way. Um, and so this guy was blind. He had a legitimate reason to beg, and that license was issued in the form of a cloak, right? So the cloak would indicate to people walking by, hey, this person is a genuine licensed beggar. He needs my money. And so what that cloak gave to that guy was a sense of security, right? The cloak wow. gave him. It was, Joseph, listen to this, brother. It was his source of income, mm. right? It, it represented security, source of income. It, um, it, it, made, it was a sense of comfort to him. He was comforted in knowing, as long as I carry this cloak, I'm going to be okay financially. So 
in order for him to ch- to step into his next chapter of his life, he had to let go of something. So he, it says that he let go of his cloak and he approached Christ. Think about the power. Think about the power of that, right? That he let go of his sense of security, what he had always known, his sense of comfort. He knew as long as I had this money would be coming in. So my question that I want to leave to you guys is what do you need to let go of? Sometimes it's a mindset. Sometimes it's a belief. Sometimes it's a habit. Sometimes it's a relationship. Sometimes it's a job. Sometimes it's a geographic location. Sometimes it's a story we've told ourselves. I'm not capable. My family is poor. You know, I'm not good enough, whatever. But here's my challenge I want to leave with you. Ask the Father to show you, Lord, what do I need to let go of in my life in order for me to receive from your hand what you want to give me? So that story inspires me, Joseph, because I've seen countless people that I've walked with, mentored, let go of a job, move into their own business, let go of a relationship, move into something better. And always there's a price, there's a cost, there's a sacrifice. It takes something of us, right? And so I guess this answers your question as well. There has been so many times where the Father has asked me to give something that I really didn't want to give. Mm. And it cost me everything, things that are dear to me. You know, Abraham, sacrifice your son, right? Um what is that for you, right? What do you need to grab onto? What do you need to let go of, right? Let's just boil it down to those two very simple concepts. But guys, you know, um, Joseph will probably talk more about this, but we'd love to see you on the rest of the journey. I'm going to go a lot deeper into these subjects and many more subjects. And, you know, I challenge you, invest in your financial future. You will you will get it back and much, much more. So I'd love to continue the journey with you, Joseph. Again, thanks so much, brother. And uh, back over to you. Bro, this is so good. And this is gold. So let me wrap this up with something here. Okay, so we're not hyping things up. We're not hype, hype, like, blah, 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 you know, like we're just straight talking, straight talking. And one of the biggest things in my heart is to take people somewhere. Like at the end of my journey, I don't want it to be that we kind of just talk stuff and people's lives never change. So when you look at Robbie's life, at Brian's life, at Sebastian's life, that is our focus that when people engage with anything that we're doing, they move. And so we've been setting something up for you that you can move your next step, your pace, your journey, your blueprint, your wealth path, and Mm -hmm. how this is really important for your purpose. You know, so uh, we did a podcast probably four or five days ago. You can check that out on the same page. And it's a longer podcast with uh, Brian Orm, Sebastian Harris, Robbie and myself. And we talked a little bit about this journey. And now we're going deeper. Tomorrow, I'm going to go deeper with Sebastian. Then I'm going to go deeper with Brian. And then next week, we're going into a workshop. You want to be on that workshop. Like we understand the importance of uh, collective consciousness, you know, the teamwork. We understand the importance of everybody rising. So our heart really is that you would also come to a place where then we could all strategize, develop together, come together and shift this whole planet, which I believe we can. And I know Robbie totally believes we can. So we want to invite you onto that. It's a free workshop. And uh, for some of you, this is your great next step. And then for some of you, this is a step on your way to springboard. You know, as you heard from Robbie, like this is, this is, we're still in the shallow end of the pool. Like there is so much more to go. And um, I think you're really going to find a lot of value. So I put the link in the caption. Check that out. Register. It's uh, it's going to be amazing. It's for four days and it begins seven days from now. Okay. So next week, Tuesday, New Zealand time, we start this wealth inheritance or wealth architecture workshop, which is going to be amazing. So make sure to check that out. Otherwise, uh, that's it from us today. And I will see you tomorrow morning with another episode. So Robbie, you stay with me, but everyone else, catch you later, guys. Take care. Bye. Bye. Faith and patience. Faith and patience. Patience means allow it to happen. Stay the same. Stay persistent. Keep going. Faith, know that it can happen at any moment. Get excited because it can happen at any moment. You're so close. Don't quit now. Keep pushing. You got this.